Hi guys, I'm back um, and this time we're going to talk about wetlands. So, so far we've talked about soil aeration and the importance for most soil organisms and many types of plants, certainly plants in agricultural, most agricultural settings um, for oxygen and the presence of oxygen and other kinds of air um, access to soil poor spaces. But of course, there are particularly, um, or there are particular ecosystems that are adapted to um, lack those oxygen um, resources or are adapted to live in places where um, the climate and the environment is such that the pore spaces are usually completely filled with water. Um, those are called wetlands, and so we're gonna talk about some characteristics of them um, in this lecture. So I'll share my screen here again. And then we can get started here. Okay, so um, a wetland um, is a very important natural ecosystem. Um, the name kind of explains what it is. It's land that's wet all the time. So we have other names that we use to describe these kinds of landscapes, swamps or marshes, kind of delta ecosystems. Um, so you've certainly come across these kinds of things before. And um, these ecosystems have a lot of important natural functions. Maybe you're aware of some of the functions that ecosystems have. Um, I'll give you a minute to think about what some of those might be. Um, so some of the things that I um, would like to point out um, are things like water for purification. So as the water um, that's moving through the pore spaces, um, in these wetlands uh, comes in contact with soil particles. A lot of different kinds of impurities will bond onto the soil and then the water that flows out of the wetland is going to be a lot cleaner than the water that flows in. Um, they also import, uh, provide important nursery habitats for many kinds of organisms, um, different kinds of birds and fish and also reptiles, mammals that may not even in their adult form spend all their life in the nursery or in these wetlands. They come to have their babies in these ecosystems, and so they're kind of important habitats to regenerate many, many kinds of organisms, again, that are not necessarily as adults wetland organisms. And then they also have important flood control capabilities. So as water flows into wetlands, all the complex structure of the wetland and vegetation in the wetland really slows down the rate of water. And so water kind of um, moves through wetlands much more slowly than in other areas. And so that can kind of um, mitigate downstream flood potential. So leaving um, wetlands in their natural state has a lot of potential benefits for people that live in the surrounding areas of wetlands. So um, according to the Clean Water Act, um, which is kind of a federal piece of legislation, um, it defines what wetlands are and it says they are those areas that are inundated or saturated by surface or groundwater at a frequency and duration sufficient to support and that under normal circumstances do support a prevalence of vegetation typically adapted for life in saturated soil conditions. Wetlands generally include swamps, marshes, bogs, and similar areas. Okay, so it's pointing out we have specific vegetation here that's different than the vegetation we have in other terrestrial ecosystems, and then we're going to have saturated soil conditions there um, because of this presence of water. So unfortunately, even though these wetlands have a lot of important ecosystem values, they have been significantly altered by humans. Um, there's a lot of different reasons that humans have um, transformed wetlands. A major one is for agriculture. These are often in low-lying areas. They're near water. And so humans have tried to drain these wetlands um, or provide different kinds of like levees to block water um, from getting in and then use these um, for agriculture, um, but also for construction, for building. And so as a result, a huge amount of habitat um, and wetland and flood control capability has been lost um, with the destruction of wetlands. So the lower 48 states, right, so not including Alaska and Hawaii, um, have about uh, 110 million acres of wetlands compared to 220 millions of um, 
acres of wetland back in the 1600s when kind of European Americans first showed up here. So we've lost about half. Um, the loss, it has slowed um, a lot because um, of a lot of regulation we have to protect the remaining wetlands. Um, but for example, in the last, um, you know, more recent time, we've still been losing significant um, wetland acreage. So like about 60,000 acres um, in the period of time between 2004 and I think that says 2010. Um, here is a map showing state by state how much they've lost. So California um, is out ahead. Uh, we've lost over 91% of our wetland. And basically we understand that most of the Central Valley and most of the Delta region in California, which are both big regions, um, were historic wetlands. And those have been profoundly altered to support lots of agriculture as well as other things. Um, it kind of starts to explain um, how much our natural ecosystems have been transformed. Okay, so again, we said um, the Clean Water Act is um, this federal piece of legislation that's supposed to protect water. Um, and in doing so, it also has some authority to protect wetlands, which we know are important habitats where water exists and are important um, ecosystems that we said provide services of water purification and flood control. And so they regulate um, dredging and filling in areas designated as wetlands. So you're not supposed to destroy wetlands because we know we want to keep those that are left. However, there's some gray area. In some cases, you can destroy wetlands as long as you protect them in other areas. So there's some wiggle room. But the basic idea is that we want wetlands to be protected. And um, then the Army Corps of Engineers, a federal um, kind of branch of the Army that's also involved in a lot of water management, um, is the group that kind of works to um, manage a lot of these um, wetlands that are protected according to the Clean Water Act. And under their um, specific definition, they say that these wetlands are areas that are um, first of all, areas that experience wetland hydrology. So hydrology is like the water behavior in an area. So they have a drainage pattern or a water regime that results in saturated soil conditions. Okay, so again, meaning the soil has no air in its pore spaces. All the pore spaces are filled with water. And so much so that it's preventing further water from draining into the soil. The gravitational potential is non-existent there, okay? So then as a result, the water ponds up during at least part of the growing season. And in lots of parts of the United States, that's gonna be the spring when either snow is melting or that's when we have significant rain um, in many parts of the Western United States. So when we're looking for where wetland is that requires protection, First of all, we're looking at this kind of water behavior. Then we're gonna look at the soils. So we're looking for poorly drained organic muck. So kind of this organic matter that hasn't really broken down. In the past, we've mentioned that in the water, there is much less oxygen and bacteria that normally break down organic matter and fungi that normally break down organic matter need access to oxygen. So when there's not oxygen present, when we have poorly aerated, saturated soils, we're gonna have this buildup of organic muck and organic peat, which is kind of almost like a mossy type material that's a big buildup of organic matter. And we also have clay there. And then it's gonna have a mottled look. So in the last lecture, we talked about these reduced versus oxidized conditions. And we said um, in reduced conditions, we have this kind of gray or green look of iron that's contained in most soils um, relative to some areas where air can get in, potentially along root channels where the soil might look redder so that we also often have this kind of like splotchy looking variations in soil color. So that would be a soil characteristic that we're looking for. And we wouldn't just be looking for that down deep in the soil where we, the soil water table might exist. Um, but in the case of a wetland, we'd be looking for that in the surface foot. So that tells us that there's a lot of water sitting in the surface soil for long periods of time. 
okay? And then finally, there's this other characteristic that we are looking for, which is specific vegetation. So there's a predominance of vegetation that is adapted to grow in areas that are seasonally saturated or inundated. So we have already used the example of like rice, um, which grows in a lot of these previously wetland areas in the Central Valley. Um, the water that used to kind of provide um, a seasonal flood in the Central Valley is channelized and used to flood specific fields um, that grow rice in the Central Valley. Um, but then, of course, if you've ever been to other marsh environments, you could probably imagine other wetland plants, cattails, um, reeds, different kinds of things that are kind of adapted to grow in soil that doesn't have the same oxygen that most other plants are dependent on. So that's called hydrophytic vegetation. And so there's a lot of um, groups that go out and work to delineate um, wetlands so we can know which areas can be developed and which areas should be protected from development. Um, a lot of different kinds of environmental consulting companies would work. Um, sending out groups to do this kind of wetland delineation and the people that work on those crews would be looking at water, they'd be looking at soil, and they'd be looking at vegetation. Um, so for instance, um, this is a particular map um, that is um, a, a place in California <clears throat> that's called Lions Canyon, um, so in Southern California, and they are basically having this kind of project and they're trying to figure out which areas need to be protected and which areas don't need to be protected. So they have this orange area, which is a corpse wetland or area according to the Army Corps of Engineer um, definition is considered a wetland. Um, and then they have um, this purple area that's a little bit beyond that, um, which is a CDFG, which is the California Department of Fish and Game, which is actually now the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, riparian wetland. So that's kind of another way to define the state of California's defining wetlands a little bit differently than the federal government. Um, but basically, this is the kind of thing that a lot of people that work with wetlands would be doing. They'd be going out and figuring out where they are. So figuring out which areas are suitable for development and which areas are not. Okay, so just to kind of dive into those three topics that we um, address a little bit more. Um, the first one we said wetland hydrology. That's something that's going to be created um, when we have water that's sticking around on the landscape for longer periods of time. So there's a variety of things about the landscape and about the soil that might cause um, water to stick around longer. Um, the first one is going to be the topography, right? So we talked about that when we talked about soil forming factors. That's kind of the shape of the landscape. Is it steep? Is it flat? And I bet you know the type of place on the landscape that usually accumulates water. Um, yep, you guess it, the low places on the landscape, right? Water flows downhill and fills up areas in valley bottoms and kind of in these drainage basins on the landscape. So if you're down low, you're much more likely to be home to a wetland than on a hill slope. There's very unusual places on hill slopes that might have little small wetland pockets, but that's mostly not true. Mostly they're in these low-lying kind of flatter areas. Um, also the geology, the parent material, right, which we also talked about in the context of um, soil forming factors. Certain kinds of rocks um, might form impervious layers or might break down more likely into certain kinds of sediments that form impervious layers. So layers near the surface or below the surface that are really difficult for water to drain through. And so they might um, encourage water ponding near the surface. And then of course, we've talked a lot about soil structure and soil texture, um, soil aggregation and its influence on um, kind of bonding with water and creating different kinds of pore spaces that may drain well or drain poorly the soil. So specifically we know things like clay um, are going to bond to water really well so they're not going to drain water as well and then soil that's more like compacted um, is more likely to have um, poor drainage things like that so anyway these are the factors that would be kind of potentially influencing whether water is going to be ponding on the surface or not um, and there are a lot of things that we do 
um, to kind of reduce residence time. So we might kind of build in drainage to natural wetlands. We might um, create little channels or little canals that we try to use to kind of get water to flow off site more quickly and concentrate water in certain places. And those kinds of actions are going to degrade wetlands. Um, there's also different things like drainage tiles that we didn't really get into. Um, that is a strategy that's used to kind of drain these kind of wetter areas. So those are not advantageous to maintaining good wetland habitat. Um, then, of course, this is a soils class, so we know people that are going out and trying to delineate wetlands um, would be looking around um, at certain soil characteristics. They'd be looking for these um, saturated soil conditions, and they'd be looking for kind of visual cues um, that oxygen is limited in the soil by the presence of water. Um, so those are, remember, reduced conditions, and we mentioned last time that Evidence of that might be included in things like reduced sulfur in the soil, which has that stinky um, rotten egg smell, and then reduced iron in the soil, which has this gray or glade color, which we can see again on the right. Um, and then we can see these little channels of red. So you can think for a moment of why those red channels might be there. Um, those are probably places where roots are kind of creating a little pathway for oxygen to get in there. And then of course, we got our Munsell soil um, color books that we've used. And you might remember the last couple pages um, of that Munsell soil color book have um, kind of these gray green pages that are used to kind of identify these wetland soils. Okay, and then the last category on there was hydrophytic vegetation, hydro meaning water, phytic meaning or loving vegetation. So we already mentioned when we originally talked about the importance of oxygen in soils that there are some kinds of plants that are adapted to live in these saturated soil conditions instead and they have to have some way to get oxygen down into the roots of the plants and so these might be um, through an elevated root system or they might have a structure where you cut into the stem of the plant where they have essentially all these hollow straws on the inside that are used to pipe oxygen down through the interior of the plant into the plant roots. So if you cut any of these wetland vegetation, um, like a cattail or a reed or anything else, you're always gonna see these kinds of hollow, what are called aryncoma cells, that are used to get the oxygen down. So people that are delineating wetlands have a key, they're looking for certain types of vegetation that they know have these kinds of structures. So anyway, that's what wetlands are all about, and um, they are kind of a unique um, soil environment that creates a unique habitat. All right, 